Good evening, everyone. Participatory programs. Hi, I'm uh, Dave Horace Anderson uh, of the Elizabeth Powell School of Law at Ace University. And I'm very pleased to welcome you today to the presentation of the 2022 Elizabeth Powell Award for Environmental Law and Diplomacy. We are especially pleased that for the first time in two years, we are holding the Cobb Award ceremony in person as well as virtual. While conducting the event online was a concession to the COVID pandemic, um, this necessity has become a virtue. We are now able to recognize our laureate in person while celebrating with many supporters and advocates worldwide at the same time. We are honored to be joined today by participants from across the globe, including Brazil, Australia, France, Morocco, Uganda, India, and so many more countries, all coming together virtually to celebrate our honor with Professor Paolo de Beza and students. Professor Beza is an environmental scholar and leading professor of environmental law at Universidad Federal do Estado do Rio de Janeiro and head of the environmental practice of Campos Melo Abogados in Brazil. He is also a Howe Visiting Scholar, was a Howe Visiting Scholar at the Elizabeth Howe School of Law in the spring of 2019. Professor Beza will receive the 2022 Howe Award in recognition of his tireless advocacy to support the development and implementation of successful uh, laws uh, in protecting the environment in Brazil including filing several successful lawsuits to protect the environment. Over the three decades, he worked in the Federal Public Prosecution Service. This award is especially timely, given that it's taking place just days after the Brazilian presidential election, which will have an enormous impact on the environmental future of the country. Professor Vesa has been valiantly fighting on behalf of that future, including the future of the Amazon. This year marks the 25th anniversary of the creation of the Elizabeth Howe Award for Environmental Law and Policy. The award was established in 1997 at Pace Law School in cooperation with the Howe family to honor the legacy of Elizabeth Howe, noted philanthropist and advocate for strong laws in the conservation of nature. The award is chosen yearly by an esteemed jury of environmental law and policy experts and was first established to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the United Nations Stockholm Conference and the 5th anniversary of the United Nations Rio de Janeiro Earth Summit. Supported by the generous Howe family, our number one ranked environmental law program continues to train lawyers to understand the intersection between climate justice, the environment, and the law. We are pleased to have with us today members of the Howe family, who will help present the award, and also pleased to have with us several members of our faculty and of uh, the Distinguished Howe Award Jury. We thank you for volunteering your time to recognize exceptional accomplishments in the field of environmental law and diplomacy. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Case University's president, Marvin Frizzlow, a lawyer by training who is also deeply concerned with preserving our environment and committed to supporting the efforts of Howe Law in our environmental law program. I will now turn the podium over to President Chris Hall. Thank you, Horace, and hello, everybody. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. And on behalf of everyone at Pace University and Elizabeth Howe School of Law, thank you for joining us tonight as we honor Professor Paolo um, I also have to say, and this is a little off script, that I'm really pleased to see Dean Emeritus Dick Ottinger, whom I haven't seen since the pandemic uh, started. So it's really, it's really nice to see you working so well. And I also have to say, it's also great to see my friend, Professor. The Howe Law School is known for many things. We train committed and, ex and engaged attorneys. Our path to practice curriculum ensures that our graduates 
are prepared to be effective advocates as soon as they start their careers. Our clinics allow our law students to contribute to their community even while they are still in school. But more than anything else, the Elizabeth Knox School of Law is known for its commitment to and excellence in the crucially important field of environmental law. And it is our great pleasure to be stewards of the Howe Medal, the most distinguished award for environmental law and diplomacy in the world. Our partnership with the Howe family and that family's deep commitment to the environment has been crucial to the development of both this school and the field of environmental law. For decades, our faculty have been pioneers in developing environmental law, and they continue to serve as world leaders in the field. <clears throat> our alumni work in environmental agencies, nonprofit organizations, corporations, law firms, and law schools, and universities across the country and across the world. They are all following the model of Elizabeth now, who is so devoted to the progress of environmental law. She was truly a woman before her time. Long before most of us, she recognized the impact that human development has had on the world's environment, and she advocated for policies that preserve and protect the planet and our natural resources. We are so pleased to have this law school and this medal named in her honor. And we are privileged to have with us tonight Elizabeth's grandson, Kistan, and his daughter, Anna Sophia, who together will present Professor Bessa with his honor. Their commitment and that of our Pace University trustee, Lillian Howe, represent the family's ongoing commitment to this cause, this award, and this school. And we are deeply, deeply grateful. Christian, Anna Sophia, thank you. Professor Bessa, congratulations. And now I am pleased to introduce Howe Law Professor Katrina Ku, who will formally present Professor Bessa with the Howe Medal. Thank you so much, President Kinsall. I am honored as a member of the Howe Award Jury to have the opportunity to describe the work of this year's recipient of the Elizabeth Howe Award for Environmental Law and Diplomacy, Professor Paolo de Bessa and Kinney. Professor Bessa is one of the founders of Brazilian Environmental Law. He received his bachelor's degree from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, a master's degree from the Pontifical Catholic, Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro and a doctorate degree from the State University of Rio de Janeiro. He has since had a 42-year career in environmental law that spanned public and private practice. And I believe we're going to show you some images uh, from throughout Professor Bessa's career that represent some of his most significant achievements. Professor Bessa began his career as a member of the Federal Prosecutor's Office and was the first coordinator of the Defense of the Environment in the state of Rio de Janeiro. During his three decades in the Federal Public Prosecution Service, he used fledgling environmental laws in Brazil to file and win several seminal lawsuits to protect the environment. These lawsuits resulted in the establishment of the well-known Reserva Beach Protected Area in Rio de Janeiro, the destruction of highly toxic PCBs so that they were not released into the environment, and the abandonment of plans to construct a bridge in indigenous territory over the objection of the indigenous Charente. Professor Bessa is also a leading scholar of Brazilian environmental law. He's authored more than 280 publications in the fields of environmental law, environmental justice, and human rights. His seminal text, Environmental Law, is now in its 20th edition. His books are regularly assigned in Brazilian law schools and regarded as mandatory reading for professionals in the field. His writings are also regularly cited by Brazilian courts, including the Federal Supreme Court of Brazil. He has taught, mentored, and inspired generations of Brazilian students and young lawyers to care for their country's environmental heritage through law. As an associate professor of law and coordinator for graduate program in law and public policy at the Federal University of the state of Rio de Janeiro. He's founder of the Association of Environmental Law Teachers of Brazil, and in the last 10 years, he's supervised more than 25 academic masters and doctoral degrees. 
Professor Betha is also a highly respected legal practitioner. He's a member of the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law, president of the Environmental Law Commission of the Institute of Abogados de Brazil, president of the Brazilian Union of Environmental Law, and chairman of the Permanent Commission on Environmental Law of the Lawyers Association of Brazil. But from reading the many letters that were sent in support of Professor Betta's nomination, what is clear is that what sets him apart in the eyes of his peers in Brazil is not his record of successful environmental cases and environmental scholarship. Instead, it is his courage, his courage to use his deep knowledge of environmental law and his public stature to forcefully defend the body of Brazilian environmental law that he helped to establish and grow. Professor Betha exhibited extraordinary tenacity and courage in preventing environmental regression in Brazil. He's used his position as a highly respected legal scholar and practitioner to speak loudly and forcefully to resist efforts to undermine the environmental rule of law in Brazil, despite the very real political and personal perils of doing so. Most notably, he co-authored an open letter critiquing rollbacks in Brazilian environmental policy. One of Professor Bessa's peers in nominating him to this award said he is constitutionally incapable of turning a blind eye to injustice, environmental, or other reasons. In gratitude for Professor Bessa's work on their behalf, the indigenous Charente people of Brazil presenting, presented him with honorary citizenship. We also wish to recognize and express gratitude for his contribution and are pleased to have Christian Howe and Anna Sophia Howe here to present the 2022 Elizabeth Howe Award for Environmental Law and Diplomacy to Professor Bessa. I'd now like now to invite uh, Christian and Anna um, Sophia. It is my distinct pleasure to be here on behalf of uh, our family, representing my wife, who unfortunately due to COVID couldn't be here herself. But I'm thrilled to have uh, my daughter Anna Sophia with her with me. Her middle name is Elizabeth. We didn't know when she was born that this name, this middle name, which was after my grandmother, would be an inspiration to her later in life because he is now in the fourth generation representing our engagement and passion for the environment and sustainability. And therefore it is uh, very fitting that uh, she is here tonight on this really very important occasion to present this wonderful award that uh, my grandmother inspired so many years ago. And she would be so proud as well as my father who took up her work after her and, uh, and now my generation to see that we can honor these amazing, amazing diplomats and lawyers who are fighting the so important fight that we have a, a world, a sustainable world to pass on to this next generation. Uh, and uh, I'm very pleased you also have your daughter with you, and uh, it shows this is uh, a, a family commitment. And uh, as much as you know, we support our families, we also need to support our planet for the future. This award recognizes the innovation, the skill, and the accomplishments of those who work to sustain and strengthen the world environmental order. And we can think of no better tribute to the life and legacy of my grandmother, who worked tirelessly to promote an appreciation of nature and the sound stewardship of sustainable development in times when there were no environmental laws and regulations. Uh, we're talking about the 1960s in Germany, and uh, here we are a relatively short time later, and, and we have accomplished a lot. And uh, uh, I've also expressed my, uh, my personal uh, enjoyment and, and gratitude that uh, when we talked years ago about endowing the law school here at Case, that only a few years later, uh, you would become the leading environmental law school in the country and probably in the world. 
is uh, something we are really truly proud and I want to thank all of you that are working so tirelessly to uh, accomplish that and of course now now that you are on top you have to work even harder to stay there. <laughs> We know there are other programs out there who are very, very envious of, of your position. Through this award, for 25 years, we have recognized the, the diplomats, the policy makers, the lawyers and activists who have sought to protect our environment through the rule of law, the cooperation of world government, and the group efforts of advocates across the globe. And it is our hope that with this award, we are making a statement in support of those individuals and communities who are fighting to create a more sustainable planet. And so uh, it is my, it is our, and also on behalf of my wife, distinct pleasure to officially welcome Professor Paul Abassa Antunes as our 2022 laureate. On behalf of the Hope family, please accept my congratulations on this honor, which recognizes your many contributions to the global conversation on environmental protection and climate justice. I'd like to invite my colleague, Professor David Casido, and Director of the Brazil America Environmental Law Institute. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, everyone, for, for being here. It's uh, it's such a treat for me to be here with you, Paulo. It's uh, you know, you've all heard about his accomplishments in Brazil and globally and and they're extraordinarily impressive, as you know. But I do also just want to say that uh, Paulo has been has taught, I think, for ten years to my uh, to my piece, my whole law class uh, in Brazil. Whenever we go down to Brazil, we bring home students, and Paulo has been guest lecturing and just been so extraordinary and, and so generous with, with his knowledge and and the and. So many of our students have benefited from, from your work, and I just want to acknowledge that as well. So thank you for that. Thank you, but uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, these people in jury who honored me with this award that I think it's quite undeserved, but uh, <laughs> I think it's a kind of recognition of uh, People that down in Brazil is uh, struggling for keeping our environment safe and to to support our environment a lot. We now faces some threats that we've been through the last four years. It was uh, four years very tough, but I think that finally we something new is moving on the horizon for the next year. But we need to keep an eye on the new situation. And regarding to what David had said, uh, I think that's my my duty as a professor to to help students, and I'm doing very grateful for me it's as well to to help the students. And I've been doing that. I didn't remember that it, it was such a long time, but it was a pleasure. And everything that every time that you need, you just follow me. As James Taylor said, I will be there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just again, one brief aside before I, we dive into the substance, because one of the things that, that makes uh, Paulo such an uh, uh, excellent guest lecturer for our students is 
you can ask him a question as I'm about to about you know what some issue of, of Brazilian environmental law. And he will say, well, in order to understand that, you need to understand how the Portuguese colonized Brazil in, in you know, in the, in the 16th century, 15th century, you know, and then, and then it'll work back to the next 600 years forward so that you can properly understand what's, what, what's going on. So, so that is a, as a background, um, let me just dive right into it. I have some, some, some questions for you, and I'm, I'm hoping We'll have some, you know, time for to hear questions from other folks as well. But let's let's start with what's it's so much in the news now, other than the Brazilian election, which would be the, the, the Amazon region, which has been under such onslaught in in the recent year, well, forever really, but but particularly in in the past presidential uh, administration. And um, I guess I'm I'm wondering what do you see as the most urgent threats to the Amazon, and what uh, legal tools exist and that we're looking to as, as we look forward to how we can help preserve. Well, I think that uh, when we, we talk about Amazon, it's uh, it's kind of weird because uh, in fact we have a lot of Amazons. Amazons are a very very sophisticated ecosystem, and they have different uh, systems. I, I think that uh, when David uh, talks about Amazon. He's, he's focused on Amazon forest because we have some other uh, ecosystem in the area, not just the, the main ecosystem in the area of the forest. Um, I think that the uh, forest faces uh, major threats like uh, loggers, uh, illegal miners. Uh, trafficking of uh, animals, drugs, uh, weapons. Uh, and Brazilian government is uh, very uh, bad uh, funded to, to perform what needs to be performed in Amazon. So I think that uh, international cooperation is very desired and needed to, to, to protect the Amazon forest. And we need to understand that protecting Amazon forest is mainly to protect the people who live in Amazon, especially indigenous peoples and traditional communities. We have a lot of traditional communities in Amazon and uh, former runaway slaves sites which are called Quibobos uh, in Brazil and Marum, say in English. Protecting these people, for me, is the, the main question that we have, because they, they will protect us. Without them, it's impossible to protect Amazon forest due to the, um, the huge size of the forest. So there is no armed forces or police force that can do that. We need to, to have protection by the people who live there. And we need to, to fund these people properly to, and give them the, the strongest to do that. And when it comes to the legal framework, I believe that Brazil still has a good legal framework to protect the Amazon. Of course, it's not a, a marvelous frame, framework, but it, 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 is, it can do the job. I think that the, 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 the set of legislation that we have can do the job, but we need to have funds to do that. We need to, to have a qualified personnel to do that. And, and so international cooperation, in my opinion, is uh, capital for this uh, purpose of protecting the Amazon forest. Mm. Well, you, you mentioned the, the indigenous people who, who live in the Amazon as well, and, and we've also been uh, very much aware of the tragic deaths of so many uh, indigenous folks and as well as those who would seek to protect the number in, 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 in the recent years. And in fact, as you, as you know, uh, the 2020 College Environmental uh, Law and Diplomacy Award was presented in memory to uh, environmental defenders and in recognition of those who lost their lives defending their land. Um, and so when we talk about 
international cooperation. We talk about the communities who need protection. I'm wondering what do you think in terms of how we can uh, protect those who are under, in such danger, those who live and, and work and you know, help them. You know, they felt they're part of the, the Amazon ecosystem. So, the problem is that uh, as uh, Elizabeth Humphrey Ward was for environmental defenders mm -hmm. two years ago, one year ago. This is a problem because uh, Brazil has, in the last 10 years, uh, Brazil is number one in murdering of environmental protection people. So, uh, of course, we have police force in the Amazon. We do have the army and we have a better agents for indigenous people's protection. But the, the point is, even in the, even in the protected areas that uh, belongs to Brazilian national system of protected areas, we, we are very understaffed. This is one point. If you go to the Brazilian environment and protection needs, we have more people in Brasilia, which is the capital of the country, than in the Amazon. What, for me, it makes no sense. If I were the president of the Brazilian protection agents, I would transfer the, the headquarters to the Amazon, mm -hmm. at least for some period of time. Because makes no sense to have more people in Brazil than on the ground. This distance, it uh, incentivates uh, murders, burglars to invade and protect the protected areas. For, for me, this is one of the, the main things that we need to have, is to, to change upside and down the way uh, Brazilian law sees how to, to handle Amazon uh, protect the areas in indigenous people. We had the NSUNAI, which is the indigenous people agency in Brazil. Last four years, we had some kind of a president that was frankly against the rights of the indigenous We had a big invasion in Yanomami areas with uh, illegal miners. Um, everything that we can figure out was invading. The Yanomami people. people are about 30,000 people. They, they suffer very, very much because they, they are not isolated, but they are quite like being isolated. They are very, very fragile people. And the Brazilian government in the last period did not play the role in the government was supposed to. So my opinion is to improve the protection, we need to change the headquarters of some things to move it into the Amazon. It's very interesting. Um, as, as we're talking about environmental protection just as a, as a larger concept, let's broaden it out to another one of the things that threaten the Amazon, but also threatens every region, every bioregion in the world and all which would be climate change. Um, <laughs> now, we in the United States have our own political struggles with uh, the idea of climate change, which is, you know, even still in 2022, a controversial subject to talk about in some areas and also implementing genuine um, regulatory reform to help combat climate change. What, um, I guess I have two questions for you. How do you see Brazil in the coming years? Um, what do you think Brazil ought to do that it hasn't done with respect to uh, addressing climate change? And, and what do you think that our two countries can learn from each other in terms of how to work together since we're, we're both, both countries are so, so important to uh, mitigating and remediating climate change? Well, when it comes to climate change, bring us back to the Amazon. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
It's a pity that uh, seven of the ten uh, biggest greenhouse gas emission came from the atmosphere. Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, and Serra, which are three, Sao Paulo is the biggest city in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro is the second biggest city, city. and Serra is a big city in the Spirit Sun State. The, the, the main green, green, greenhouse gas emission comes from the atmosphere. So now it's uh, becoming clear to scientists that maybe uh, the Amazon is uh, emitting more greenhouse gases than capturing it from, from the, the atmosphere. So it's, it's a problem. The main, the main problem that Brazil has with uh, climate change is deforestation and fire. Deforestation and fire. Uh, are responsible for about 50% of Brazilian greenhouse gas emissions. So if, if we stop deforestation and if we stop uh, fire in, in, the, in the jungle, in the forest, it, it will help a lot. But uh, we need to be aware that uh, now the biggest fire uh, don't come from the atmosphere. It comes from Cerrado which is a kind of savanna that we have in Brazil, which is being, uh, the wood has been cut off in a very speedy, uh, speedy very speedy the cutting off of the, the wood. And even in the Pantanal, which is a uh, wetland in Brazil, in Bolivia and Paraguay, even in Pantanal, we have seen some, some fires. These are the big problems that we have. Brazil is, is uh, changing uh, very fast to renewable energy, uh, especially uh, wind, uh, wind power and so on. But uh, the, the principal problem is deforestation and fire. And if we do that to stop deforestation and fire, I think that we, we can play a uh, Good role in climate change. And Brazil, of course, has been very vocal and relevant when it comes to some uh, some mechanism in the international treaties related to climate change, like the MDL and the uh, uh, carbon credits, etc. Brazil has played an important role, and I believe that will be play in the next uh, administration. And don't forget that uh, the elected president uh, Lula is not, it will be next uh, week in Shannon Sheikh in the COP27. A very refreshing change. That's, that's for sure. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit more about um, well, international cooperation. You have, uh, I think, a unique perspective on this during many decades in the Ministry of Publico as well as in private life, and, and as a, a renowned scholar of, of environmental law, both international and otherwise. Um, what, what do you see as, you know, how, you mentioned earlier international cooperation in helping uh, care for the Amazon. How, do you have any ideas on what, should, how that can work, and what kind of other types of international cooperation you think would be um, essential to the Brazilian environmental legal regime? Well, first of all, we need to understand that the population in the Amazon is seventy percent is urban, and the cities in the Amazon uh, have uh, like. Uh, sort of problems like uh, lack of sewage and lack of water treatment. So I think this is one point that we need to address because uh, when it comes to foreigners, they, they, they look at the Amazon as a kind of a blurred image that uh, 
you you figure out that there is only jungle and forest. That is not true. We need to have these cities, and the cities problems must be addressed by and I think that international cooperation is important for that. We, we need to to because Brazil is since uh, 1972 in the Stockholm conference in Sweden, Brazil had a uh, let's say a word uh, rule in Sweden because everybody said but the Brazilian government at that time said the worst pollution was the poverty pollution. And it's not the case. But since then, Brazil has uh, uh, amplified the number of protected areas, has increased the numbers of uh, regulation protecting indigenous people, has uh, um, created a uh, a big set of environmental regulations. I think that Brazil has a good set of legislation, but Brazil doesn't have the money to put all these regulations in function. So this is one point of international cooperation. And I think that if we, if we think about uh, how the energy should be, I think that biotechnology and uh, some products of the forest, and, and especially traditional knowledge of indigenous people in uh, traditional community, may help a lot. So we need to go into the, the trips agreements and have uh, uh, arrange the intellectual property rights of these indigenous people and uh, the, his knowledge. It's, uh, it's mandatory for a new future in the act. So I think that this is this may be the the main questions that the new Brazilian administration should address within the international community. So that that sort of brings me to to the, a question you mentioned several times, um, and I, I think I mean when we talk about this. Before you went on, Brazil's environmental laws are very, very impressive and strong. And but there's a the a lot of the challenges don't have to do with the laws themselves, it has to do with other sort of external forces. What what do you see as are in, in addition to the lack of funding that you, you talked about, um, the major regulatory challenges to enacting a strong climate force in, in Brazil? Well, there is something that uh, is, it's funny because uh, sometimes you have regulations, you have law, but uh, they, they play a role, like being some kind of uh, just a an image that you that you put, but it's not real. You, you, you have the image, you have the, the regulation, but when, when it comes to, to enforce, you don't enforce it really. So it's a kind of a, of a duration thing that we just think of. But putting put into enforcement of this law, in my opinion, uh, we need, first of all, that the, the, the society must believe that the law is good for the society. I think we are still a little bit far from this this uh, idea in the Brazilian society because there is still some visions that uh, proposes environment and development and and the idea of development is, uh, is in my opinion is a completely false idea because it relies on in growing growing and, and the growing 
is what caused the problem. So we need to, to, to see the devil in, in the uh, other way, how, how to see the real devil. And we in Brazil, we still uh, look at uh, Europe or US and Japan, and you think that the devil is being just like they are. And it's, it's not the case. So you need to, to, to rephrase what we understand. Okay. This is one point. The second, if we have that soul, the, the, the law should be enforced. But there is something that uh, last four years that we had in Brazil that was some kind of changes in the laws or even not in the law itself, in the, the understanding of how the law works. So the, the change in this understanding that now is the, the, the main understand that the Brazilian administration has is very important because we have some, some uh, uh, decisions from the agents that uh, changed a lot the, the, the meaning of Brazilian legislation when it comes to environment protection. So it will be very complicated to, to change that in the next following years because, uh, and it's something that uh, for me is uh, very sad because we are seeing now in Brazil in a group of young lawyers that are involved in environmental issues that we are talking about the agro-environmental law. So it's something that, uh, that uh, mixes every business in environmental law, which is, in my opinion, completely apart. So this, this uh, uh, idea of young, because when I started with the environmental law, and I think it was the same for the first generation. I, will, I was a mountain climber. I, I, I used to, 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 to go to the woods, etc. So it, so it was one of the, the major forces that brought me to environmental. Nowadays, it's not this way. We see people going to, young lawyers going to environmental law just to, to make money. And I think it doesn't work with environmental law. If you want to make money in law, to go to tax law or something like that. Okay, but this is one problem that we have. This is a very serious problem. Yeah, I'm, I'm here to tell you the money's not in environmental law. <laughs> but um, let, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the, in fact, again, I think you're, you're talking about the part of a broader idea, which is this, um, you know, young, young environmental lawyers are not necessarily engaged with the environment in a way. And, and, and I think that's, a, a, in my opinion, I think one of the problems we face as a global society is the fact that it's very difficult to, to explain um, the, the severity of the environmental problem we face to people for whom it's not an everyday concern and who may themselves have far more urgent concern, be it putting food on the table or, or, or what, what have you, raising a family. So say, environmental concerns are often not necessarily in the forefront of people's minds. And yet the issues grow so, so urgent and so much more urgent every day. What, how, how do we get, it's, I know this is a very broad question, but in, in Brazilian culture, is, is uh, sustainability and environmental future something that is a, 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 a very a, a topic at the forefront of conversation a lot? Or, and and if, if so, or even if not, how can the rule of law um, help guide us forward in both in Brazil and elsewhere on this issue? I don't know if that question made sense. Yeah, it makes sense, but I believe that there is an important difference between law in general and environmental law. Because law in general, 
comes after something happened. So something happened, that one comes, and, and you you regulate. Environmental law is not prospective. So environmental law tends to to design the future, to design how things should be. It's for me, it's, it's a, a very important difference between regular law and environmental law. Of course, when when we we we, we think of environmental law, we see three pillars: the environment itself, economy, and human rights. The, these three three bases that create environmental. In Brazil, it's becoming clear that uh, the water, the big cities in Brazil are bringing water for every day, more distant places. Uh, the cost of treatment of the water is higher and higher in Brazil. I think the same in the US and other countries. We are having uh, problems with coastal lines in lots of cities, especially in Rio de Janeiro. Rio de Janeiro is, uh, is, uh, is a complicated case because 80% of the water that we use in the city of Rio de Janeiro comes from just one river, who is heavily polluted. This is becoming clear to the people, but uh, it's uh, it's a long way, but we need to understand, as someone said before, environmental law has 50 years. Civil law has 2,000 years. So 50 years is a short period of time. And I think that we have uh, accomplished uh, a big deal in spreading the word of environmental law, although, all the international treaties, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the results are, let's say, humble. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I think we're uh, <laughs> ready for some some questions, not for me, which would be a reading for you, I'm sure. Um, so. Uh, so so we can we can hear from. Some folks here, and then we'll hear for some folks playing at home. Good evening. Hi, Professor Benson. Um, my question is what's the role of the Supreme Court of Brazil and the judiciary system in the protection of the environment? Well, the courts. The country of Brazil, the US, play an important role in environmental protection. It's a complicated role because we have this difference to the agents, different to the administration, but I think that in the end of the day, the courts are important because uh, you see that uh, sometimes. Courts are the the last door that you have to, to not go and, and ask for help. So I think they, they especially Brazilian Supreme Court now is playing a very important role. We have the uh, uh, last uh, two or three months to have the green package of Brazilian Supreme Tribunal Federal. And they they put together lots of uh, lawsuits related to environmental protection and the result uh, was let's say eight percent more uh, i think it was it was an amazing day and supreme tribunal federal our supreme court is being heavily criticized because uh, lots of people don't understand that uh, the legal issue of the environmental law is quite different from the, let's say, the regular side of the law. Because 
we need to deal with principles. It's, uh, it's in my opinion, it's mandatory to, to, to deal with principles. Of course, we, we, we can have, a, we must be a little bit uh, cautious with principles, but principles are very important in Latin America, especially in Brazil, who has a very broad constitution with lots of principles. So the Supreme Court have understand, understood, in my opinion, correctly how to apply environmental law principles. And the Supreme Court understood that the environmental law is about protection. So if you have a doubt on how to apply uh, a certain rule of law, you need to, to stay in the safe side, which is to stay in the protection, the precaution. So the Supreme Court has done this, this, this rule, I think, quite fairly. Hi, Professor. Thank you. Uh, uh, congratulations. I really appreciate your opportunity to be part of all. And the second, uh, I am I'm from a developing country, so I can really relate to the dilemma you mentioned, please, how to balance the, uh, the development and environment. Uh, and one thing that really stands out for your speaking is deforestation. Uh, and my question is, from the international perspective, how, uh, do you think there is any like, opportunity to uh, make uh, to combine the domestic law and the international environmental law to you know to cope with this uh, issue, which is deforestation. Well, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, Brazil is part of the vast majority of the international multilateral environment agreement, and. Uh, Brazilian domestic law complies with, with uh, uh, international treaties. Uh, we have uh, our constitution that uh, clearly stresses that uh, Amazon, Pantanal, etc. Some of the main ecosystems in Brazil uh, have uh, special protection. We have the law on uh, protected areas. We have a forest code and uh, another law for public lands concessions. So this is our legal framework. But we need to, to, to understand that the responsibility in environmental issues are every country has responsibility for the, the, the protection of the world environment and uh, we have a different responsibility for each country so Brazil and other countries uh, in the Amazon we have a treaty the Amazon Treaty Organization this country has responsibility for protecting, but as this forest helps the global climate, so it's fair that the people have polluted the most bring some funds to help the other fund government to protect this land. But this is an issue because everybody agrees, but when it comes to put the, the, the money on, the thing stops. So this is a general agreement, but uh, funding is still a problem. And I think it will be for a long time. Yes, um, good morning, everyone. Um, congratulations, um, Professor Lessa, for the award. And um, I would also like to take the opportunity to recognize Brazil's early years last time. Since the Rio conference in 1992, to advance environmental um, law and environmental treaties worldwide, 
and for its efforts to prevent involvement in the climate change promotion and prevention of biological diversity. My question to you is uh, regarding the food minus DC climate change. How do you think that climate change mitigation might be nationally determined contributions from uh, being voluntary to perhaps becoming mandatory to judicial decisions and um, litigation? Thank you. Thank you for the question. This is a tough question. Because uh, if we this is yeah, this is a tough question. You see that uh, in Brazil, our Supreme Court allows retroactivity of the laws for civil laws, not for criminal laws. So it's uh, under Brazilian courts, it's feasible to sue someone or some government for past pollution. I think this is a trend that is coming to happen more and more. We have some some uh, some lawsuits in Holland, the Netherlands. Uh, I think that uh, in Great Britain too, and in Brazil we have one lawsuits uh, lawsuit uh, about the forest issue. But I think this is a trend, and it will be more and more common, especially to big oil, because uh, uh, there is a lot of discussion about how these big oil companies, they, they are trying to deal with uh, climate change. The idea of uh, putting uh, CO2 on the underground, for me, it seems to be difficult to believe. So, and the fact is that the emission is being increasing since the signing of UNFCC convention. Since 1972, until now, the emissions are increasing. So it's curious because we have a convention, we have 26, we have an agreement, by the Paris Agreement, one convention, uh, Montreal Protocol, Kyoto Protocol, and the greenhouse gases in the emission is increasing. So I think that uh, lots of NGOs are going before the courts and they are suing. And I believe that uh, it's very likely that some NGOs will win this lawsuit uh, due to the experience that we have gathered all over these years. It's very feasible to have some uh, some uh, ruling against companies to comply with uh, the conventions. Hi, Professor, thank you for all of your work. Um, going back to what you mentioned about uh, all of the riches uh, that the Amazon has to offer and knowledge, um, I would like to uh, bring light to the fact that Brazilian intellectual property law is relatively new, being from like 96 to 98. So my question is, how do you see this landscape uh, forming itself towards developing further intellectual property law in Brazil as to protect this knowledge, especially considering that now, even though uh, we have a more emeritus president uh, going to office next year, but with a Congress and a Senate that's relatively still conservative and focused on big economic development uh, tasks. That's uh, intellectual property laws kind of a contradiction with uh, indigenous people 
let's say, computational rights, because they, they don't think of individual rights as we do. But the, the fact is, they must play play the game because if, if they don't play the game, they will uh, lose lots of things. So uh, Brazil has uh, recently uh, passed a law called the Goya Protocol. So now we have a regulation to uh, access and benefit share, which is complicated because there is. Uh, I, I have worked with property law some 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 time in my life. So and we have discussed a lot about how to do that because when you have a traditional knowledge, sometimes this traditional knowledge belongs to various people. You, you cannot just say which people really is the owner of this knowledge because the idea of a property. Is a Western idea. It's not the indigenous people idea. So for for them, it's sounds a little bit weird. But uh, we need to address this 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 issue. The WIPO is discussing it for, as I remember, as far as I remember, twenty years at least. But now it's becoming more. Urgent in this issue because uh, society have, have understood that we need to, to, to protect indigenous people because they protect us. And, and, and uh, it's clearly unfair the share that has been done with their knowledge and what they, they received from them. Okay. This is this is a, I think this is one problem that we need to address when it comes to environmental law. But under this umbrella, environmental law, there is a plate of different things that uh, now we are talking about property rights and intellectual property rights in environmental law. But in my opinion, there is a. a Face of the environment, but it's more than the environment. I think that uh, uh, this is one thing that I've been thinking that the environmental law is going to to split into many different kinds of things. And the idea for me is that uh, the environment should be one of the worries in each branch of law. If we get there, I think that the, the environmental law uh, has, has done well. We need to put the, the, the worry of the environment in civil law, tax law, uh, whatever. Because if we if we stay in the ghetto of the environmental law, it is bad for the environment. We need to have this spread out in all the, the, the fields of law. So, so we have a, a question from um, a Zoom audience member who's uh, interested in, in the um, well, we mentioned the recent election in Brazil, and um, and he, he's wondering um, whether you see this as an opportunity for a real, real hope for uh, progressive environmental reform in in Brazil, and and also. Uh, you mentioned earlier the idea of, of moving some of, for example, the environmental enforcement offices to the Amazon. What would you like to see accomplished first, assuming that you do agree that Lula's election is, is a real harbinger of good? Well, I think that uh, we need to be, uh, when it comes to politics, we need to be a little bit pragmatic. So uh, I don't see changes. In the written environmental law in Brazil, I think that is a, it's a threat to send bill to the Congress to change something in environmental law in Brazil. I, I think that what we have is good for for the people because the, the majority of the 
of Congress now is frankly against the environment. So if we keep what we have, I think it's good. And uh, I, I believe that uh, we are going to have some new policies in environmental law, in the enforcement of environmental law. The, 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 the main problem that we have now is to enforce the legislation that we already have. Okay, I think that the rural administration will try to do that. Uh, the people who is in the transitional government is uh, people that is engaged in environmental protection. And uh, yeah, I, I believe that the enforcement will increase. But uh, uh, we need to be aware that Brazil is facing a very severe uh, budget crisis. So to enforce, we need to have budget. Brazilian uh, environmental ministry budget had, was never big, was uh, tiny, but uh, now it's uh, the, the tightest ever. So we need to, to, to fund it again. Uh, Norway, who is, uh, who gave the Greater Brazil Amazon fund, which is a kind of a one billion dollar. Now this fund will be uh, active again. It was freezed by the last administration because the uh, uh, Bolsonaro administration wanted to use the money to buy land and the titles in Brazil are very complicated, so buying land was, in fact, transferred uh, money to illegal owners. So Norway blocked the, the, the fund, and now the fund will be uh, in place again. So it will be very good because it's one billion dollars. I think that some new money will come. Uh, and we need to be very transparent in how we apply this money. And of course, we need to have a good cooperation. We need to show what we have been done. Okay. We're, we're running short on time, but I do want to uh, just include one question from, from uh, Lillian Paul, uh, which is what, what do you see um, the biggest change with the new leadership in Brazil over the next four years? What, so following up on the question you just asked, but I think it's Bring it in another direction. Well, I think that the, the main main change that we are going to have a brick over. And this is a, the main question. We we are we are we faced a very deleterious period. I think that now we have we, we come back to normal life. We can have bad government, we can have good government, but it's uh, normal. We, we've been uh, in a, uh, uh, a sea of madness. So I think that we are going to have regular government. And I think that the ruler, which is 77, he, I think that he wants to, to in this final moment of uh, his political life, I think that he wants to to let something good for the country. I think th this is something that he has within him. So I think that we are having more enforcement and peaceful uh, political manners among the Brazilian civilization because what we have in this last four years was unbearable. It was. Well, if, if you find yourself on the, the shore of Sea of Madness, please do toss a line and we'll know if there's still bopping in the surf. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, let me, uh, I, I believe we, that, that's the last question. And at this point, I, I'd like to invite um, our great friend Dick Robinson on stage to offer a few remarks. Well, thank you very much. This was the most stimulating panel, and I think the uh, laureate of the Elizabeth Howe Award uh, uh, has demonstrated in the intelligence and the wisdom of his responses the reasons why he is the laureate this year. We, we're 
grateful to you for sharing with us uh, this wisdom. I think it's fitting that the last question came from Lillian Howe, uh, because as I was sitting thinking about this wonderful event, I was thinking back to the early 1970s when Elizabeth Howe was uh, on the board of the World Wildlife Fund in Germany and was basically trying to create the enthusiasm for using the law to protect nature, using the law to protect the environment in, in the wildlife. Uh, and she was ahead of her time. Uh, she saw the gap in the law and policy and she wanted to make it change. And so she did. And uh, the, uh, I would say uh, the wisdom and intelligence, but also the DNA of the family, uh, this is carried on uh, through Aravad and Christian and now in the next generation. Uh, so, yeah. so we're grateful to the Howe family, uh, but especially for what Elizabeth taught us. And we're here to continue learning from Elizabeth. I want to thank everyone who made this event possible, uh, the jury, uh, uh, President Krishloff and, and Dean Anderson, uh, the faculty, uh, and above all, the Howe family. Uh, we stand adjourned and I thank you for this wonderful celebration.